the uh, few weeks after the uh, APMP uh, Global Bid and Proposal Conference. This year it was held in San Diego a few weeks ago. They had record numbers attending this year, which was fantastic. And uh, APMP is the Association of Proposal Management Professionals. And it's grown to be a, a group of professionals of, of thousands of people worldwide who focus on business development. And so we, we wanted to time this particular topic to be after that conference so that we could incorporate some of the trends, some of the best practices that many of you who might have attended and many of us who attended uh, heard, learned about, and, and listened to. So that's, uh, that's why this falls when it does. Uh, with us today, we have uh, myself, we have David Bull uh, with Shipley, Senior Vice President of our Business Winning Services, Eric Gregory, uh, Senior Vice President, focuses on the eastern part of the U.S., David on the western part of the U.S., and not pictured here, but with us is Daryl Jones, and he is Senior Vice President of Business Development. Daryl has a lot of experience. Uh, selling in a variety of uh, industries, uh, not just business to government, but business to business uh, and business to consumer. And so we've got a really good cross-section of people here who have uh, worked with clients in, in a variety of industries. So we'd like to jump right in uh, to the topic and go through some of these trends. And thankfully, some of you, many of you actually, submitted questions as you registered for this webinar. And so those questions, a lot of those are gonna be addressed in these best practices because you asked about them. Uh, and others, so I'm gonna pause during the webinar and actually read these questions and ask uh, someone on the panel here to address, to address the topic. So anyone interested could certainly follow us on uh, a live Twitter feed that we're running. Uh, there's the uh, address. So you can you can find us there. Uh, you, you can you can uh, follow us live and so forth. And we'll be we'll be tweeting a few things as we go during the webinar today. So here are the best practices. Excuse me, the trends and best practices we settled on after talking to many of you, many of our clients. Trends that are going on. The virtual workforce. What what does that mean to us? What about recruiting? in business development? What are some trends and, and impacts there? New competitors entering the market, more online bid requests, acquisition portals, social media, unpredictable customer buying schedules and processes, uh, the balance of cost and, and risk as it relates to evaluation, source selection committees and the evaluation process. What about automation in business development? What impact might that have on us? And one trend we're certainly seeing is business development is becoming more widely accepted as a really very important part of any business. You know, uh, companies used to spend, still do, thousands, millions of dollars on change management, organizational change initiatives, but way too often, historically, business development as an organization has been overlooked in those overhauls and those investments and those change management initiatives. And so we're seeing a trend more toward uh, accepting BD as a really, really critical part of, of an organization. So, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Let's go to the first one right off the bat, virtual business development workforce. So as you know, so many companies are moving to a dispersed workforce, uh, including business development personnel at all levels. Levels, And I know we all have our own bias and opinion on this to, as to the value of being co-located ver versus being dispersed. But like it or not, the trend is there's, there's more remote people working for us. Um, often companies are placing business development personnel uh, near the customer as opposed to near their corporate headquarters. And the proposal team might be at corporate headquarters or a another div division location. And this actually addresses one of the questions someone submitted before the webinar is, you know, if we're not close to the customer, how do we interact and, and, and get involved and get in front of the customer? Well, 
more and more companies are actually placing business development people near customer sites and they're working remote. How, how to effectively manage a virtual BD team and organization. So I'm gonna ask Daryl here in just a minute. Daryl has been managing a virtual business development organization for quite a while. But these are some tips and I'm gonna add Daryl, ask Daryl to add to them. One thing we need to do is over communicate when we're dealing with virtual business development teams. Uh, we can't just rely on water cooler talk or running into someone across the hall or, or running out to lunch with them. We've got to find other ways to communicate. We can't be, uh, you know, we can't be short-sighted on technology. It may require some additional investment in collaboration tools, technology. Virtual or not, especially virtual, though, you've got to get to know your people. And uh, I happened to moderate a panel at the conference two weeks ago that was focused on this very issue. If, as business development leaders or professionals, we don't know our people, we aren't doing our jobs. Uh, and then it's really important, especially with dispersed uh, remote work teams, that we clarify everybody's role and responsibility because we don't have that benefit of just rubbing shoulders with people and talking through some of this. So starting out with a pursuit, with an opportunity, everyone needs to be really crystal clear on their role and their responsibilities. Daryl, would you would you take a second and just from your experience share any thoughts you have on on virtual teams? Sure, Brad. Like you said, I've been doing this a long time and a few things that uh, I think are critical when you have a virtual BD team. Uh, the first, really from a manager's perspective, is because you lack the frequent face-to-face -face communication where you get real feedback, body language feedback, and so on, uh, you really have to under understand your people. There's a balance between, between treating everybody the same, which I think of as more treating everybody uh, fairly so your management style is predictable and people know what's expected of them, and then treating them all very differently. It's critical uh, with BD people, and I think this is everyone generally, but BD people, people in particular, to understand uh, their communication style. For example, some of, some of my BD people I talk to daily. They like the feedback, they like the sharing of ideas, they like frequent communication. Others would really prefer to be, uh, I would say left alone, but less communication. So it's understanding how to work with individuals that compose the team. I, I think that's probably the most important thing. Um, I think it's also critical, despite a dispersed BD organization, that the organization invest in some face-to-face -face time with the team, whether it's a BD retreat or whatever that is. One thing that can really lack in a BD organization is sort of an esprit de corps or a, a, a common, sort of a common focus, a sense of teamwork and all striving toward the same ends. So there are a lot of advantages with virtual work as Brad mentioned, but those there are some real pitfalls. And I guess the final thing would be uh, we as a company have learned this the hard way, and I, I think if your teams are going more virtual, a good uh, CRM, uh, Salesforce or Microsoft product, uh, whatever it is you choose, are critical to not only the communication, but preserving important BD data. Um, if you're in an organization where there is high turnover on the BD teams, which uh, happens, uh, we've been fortunate that that's not been the case. I say I've been fortunate that that's not been the case here. But think about preserving the customer information that is gathered over time so that if you do have uh, unforeseen turnover in your BD assets, that at least you have a trail of what's been done and can keep the, uh, the deal, the opportunity, the pursuit on track. So those are three things, Brad, that come to top of mind. 
Great. Thanks, Daryl. And, and uh, those are right on. You know, that, that first bullet here, you know, over-communicate, that could actually be an irritant to some. So your point is well taken. You know, know how your people prefer to communicate when you're working virtual. Thank you. Uh, the other, uh, boy, this came out loud and clear at, at the conference in San Diego. The other trend is, is just, you know, an, an issue, and that is recruiting the best talent. Um, you know, in in our business development communities and profession, nobody is safe. Um, all of our employees are fair game, and a lot of them have targets on their back for our competitors or others in adjacent markets to come and hire them away from us. So this became a message loud and clear. We have to do something uh, to uh, recruit, attract uh, best talent. Uh, excuse me, technology is a critical part of that. Recruiting the old fashioned way, it, you know, it's just not, it, it's not there. Um, we've got to leverage social media, um, technology, and so forth. And then that second bullet, you know, uh, younger, younger workforce, you know, we've got to be aware of that. How do we recruit, attract? And I, I suggest as a best practice, we think beyond recruiting. And as we are hiring, recruiting, we think more about retention. What are we going to do with these people once we have them onboarded? That's probably as big or bigger challenge is not just attracting, but retaining these people. Um, employee referrals. Uh, this is the old fashioned way, and this is still should be near the top of our list. We should be going to our BD workforce for great solid referrals. That's the best source. Social media, as I mentioned, is a significant tool. Uh, we have to know that a lot of people that we want on our teams, our BD teams, want to be mobile. They want to be remote. They, they want to be flexible. So here you see some statistics that we found. 37% uh, of the, the companies uh, you know, that, that were pulsed in this particular study uh, are focusing on diverse, recruiting diverse candidates. 35% uh, soft skill assessments uh, are what they provide. And uh, innovative interviewing tools. I don't know if any of you have sat there with your laptop or, or your cell phone and had to do a web interview, you know, where you're being recorded live or you have to record it and then upload it on a link as a virtual interview. Those tools are becoming more and more common, not only in business development, but in employment in general. So be aware of that. We have to be aware of that. The game is changing when it comes to recruiting and finding the best talent. The, the bottom bullet here, there's no one single approach. Uh, we all have to learn to adapt and, and, and make, make processes work for us. All right. Um, Another trend, uh, this is not so so much new as it is, it seems to be accelerating. Um, uh, David Bull, who's on this, this panel, and I had, had a discussion the other day that uh, the IT, um, the I, IT market in almost every industry is just exploding. Things are happening so fast and changing, and so, what it's doing to us is it's creating new competitors everywhere uh, all the time. Government IT, digital transformation are big buzzwords. You know, it, they are growth markets, growth segments. And so what that means is if we're in that space or aligned or adjacent to that space, uh, <laughs> there's, there's different competitors flying at us. Um, unexpected competitors. Boy, who would have guessed that some of the people, for example, that are in healthcare IT would be in that space. They had nothing to do with healthcare IT five years ago, and now here we go. Defense contractors are all of a sudden bidding on and winning contracts in complex healthcare IT projects. So teaming, alliances often form new competitors. Sometimes we're not even aware um, that these new competitors have surfaced. Mergers and acquisitions create new competitors. That's not going away. 
Um, no markets and no technologies are immune from this. Almost any market you're selling into is going to experience some new unexpected competitors. Um, unfortunately, this last bullet, sometimes we are our worst, own worst competitor because we're the incumbent and we've either failed to perform or we're taking kind of a lazy backseat approach to winning the recompete, thinking we've got it wired. And so sometimes the worst competitor is, is, is us. That's probably bad grammar, but you know what I mean. Uh, uh, Eric, uh, you've, you've seen plenty of competitors in, in your uh, work experience. Uh, could you just comment on how important it is stay, to stay up to date on, on competitors? Well, it's especially even more important now because it changes so quickly. I mean, just the recent acquisition of CSRA by by GDI, GD and then rolling it into GDIT, it created a whole new enterprise uh, that uh, people have to pay attention to. Uh, the new perspective that will be rolling out here soon, of course, which is the amalgamation of, uh, you know, DXC Technologies, uh, Vencore, and key point again these things are happening so quickly now that it's very difficult to keep up with uh, it presents opportunity as well for those of us who happen to be in this business because you know when some of these mergers and acquisitions take place it can be disruptive to some of those organizations uh, they can lose their focus so it can be uh, you know both creating a new competitor but also opening up opportunity i think the key here is that the pace is so quick uh, that we have to uh, focus a lot of attention on understanding how the competitive environment is changing on almost a daily basis. It's but it just accelerates quickly. Great, great examples. You know, and if if boy, if if we're not up on who we're competing against, and and we're putting out their bids that don't discriminate based on strengths, weaknesses, and gaps and things. Um, you know, we're guessing, and our probability of win probably isn't so strong. Thanks, Eric. That was that was great. Uh, I'm going to uh, deviate a little bit here from from the um, the next uh, trend topic, which uh, actually we wanted to talk about the fact that there's more and more online um, bidding, if you will, uh, proposals, responses, and so forth being submitted online or actually being the whole acquisition process is is through a portal. But uh, related to that, it was a question that someone submitted when they registered. And David, I'd like you to briefly address this. Because of the, the more and more online submittals, some of them are simply question and answer type things. Um, and uh others say you know hey attach your proposal in tab four um the question that was asked is, is federal proposal evaluators uh, and technical approach the question was do most prefer detailed narratives or is there a movement toward more weighting on graphics and proof boxes what are your thoughts on that question well <clears throat> Brad, thanks. The, the graphics in the proof boxes certainly draw our attention. And I think the trend has to be that you have to convey a very solid message and you have to show benefits and you have to show a reason for the customer to want to select your solution through those graphics and through those boxes in the past they've kind of been obligatory and we have maybe not taken the time to do what we've had to to enhance these because there will be a certain number of people that will simply preview the proposal by skimming through it and looking at that including evaluators to give them a degree of confidence and of course you want to do everything you can to improve that degree of confidence that your solution will in fact meet their needs however we can't lose fact that there is a source selection committee and this source selection committee will have 
uh, compliance requirements to meet. And so, you know, those are typically still met in the narrative. And we have to make sure that they can go through there and, and check them all off and we're not disqualified by meeting. So it's definitely a combination. We're seeing more, you know, graphics are becoming very, very, very powerful and very, very standard. It used to be no, but now, boy, you have to do it. And so let's enhance that opportunity so that we can sell more through the enhanced graphics, but understand the compliance still typically is uh, met through the uh, written text. Yeah, yeah, great point, and, and that that's so right. I mean, I, a session I attended at this conference I'm alluding to ha had several uh, source selection people on a panel discussion. That's what they said, just what you said, that uh, it's a balance, you know, don't, don't overkill graphics you know and don't just put them on there to be glitzy and, and interesting make sure any graphics tables charts that you include in your proposal align with your message and support the message and don't become the message that, that's what i heard loud and clear so th thanks for that david so this in a way this kind of leads to this next um, trend because when when it comes to online um, uh, portal, excuse me, these were some, some best practices, uh, Eric, I'm sorry, I should have shared this first, uh, but uh, there were actually two questions that just came in live while David was talking. Are there tools for understanding who our competitors are and so forth? And yes, there are, and I'm going to actually show uh, some of those ideas here on the next trend, but when when we consider competitors, we have to invest, be willing to invest in research and analysis. It's not an easy thing. It doesn't just happen. We have to get ahead of the game, focus on our discriminators, build our brand strength out there so that we're a little bit immune maybe from, from competitive uh, infringement. Avoid complacency, especially on incumbent uh, contracts. Um, Focus on markets where we have the best ROI, the best chance of, of a return on investment. Now, so this next trend that I alluded to is this idea that more and more of this acquisition and proposing and bidding and putting solicitations out by the government is it's becoming online. Um, and we have to be really wise. And so to the point we addressed with David's comments about graphics and visuals, unfortunately sometimes on some types of bids we're shut out from using powerful graphics or images or messages and we have to depend on our words and our strategy so this is kind of just a an overall partial very partial list of what we're seeing out there as far as um, acquisition systems where where you know, GSA posts opportunities online and, and uh, companies engage Ariba, you know, to post a procurement and you have to respond in Ariba. More and more states uh, in the United States are using online portals to accept bids and, and proposals. Uh, so that's important. So to the question that actually two of you asked while David was, was talking about graphics, are there tools? These are some tools. If you want to know who's competing in your space, now some of these require a paid subscription. So, uh, but if, if you want to know who is an incumbent on a current contract or who the incumbents are, if it's a multiple award, some of these systems are extremely detailed at providing you exactly what the government customer is spending on that contract and with whom. Well, you know then that those are your competitors. Uh, many of these platforms provide lists of who's attending industry days or bidders conferences. That's not only a potential list of competitors, it's a potential list for you of teaming partners. So we have to be willing, I believe, as business development organizations to address this trend. Uh, we can't, though, get distracted by these systems and focus on the system we have to stay focused on still evolving a win strategy if i'm responding on an online portal and it's basically a question answer type rfp i still 
have a win strategy. I still need to articulate that. I still need to be able to leverage my strengths. So there's no getting around the good old fashioned SWOT analysis on determining how we're gonna win and how we're gonna compete, even if it's online. And that's the lesson here is we can't shortchange strategy and win strategy development just because the method of acquisition has changed and shifted. So we got to answer the questions, but we've got to be responsive. So if an RFP through an online portal or on an Excel spreadsheet says, do you provide 24 by 7 customer service? We can answer yes. We can answer no, or we can answer yes, and we can go on and say, and we do that in 36 different languages. You know, it it wasn't asked for, but if we know that that international global language capability is a hot button of that customer, let's let's throw it in there. We're not we're still compliant. We're answering the mail right off the bat and we're adding value in our response. So test the systems. This, this bullet here, know and test the system early. Rehearse a submittal. Uh, many times you can actually practice submitting, uh, you know, and then delete it, and it's okay. It's okay, don't be afraid of, of testing out some of these online portal systems. Um, and then if you are submitting through a, some type of online portal, make sure you get confirmation of receipt. Boy, that's uh, that's something sometimes we forget. We think just because we sent it, it's been received. Get some type of confirmation, maybe even a phone call to somebody or an email or something. Uh, so uh, the system itself should alert you. I realize that, but you might want a second confirmation. So those are some best practices on that trend. Okay, social media. Um, we did a whole webinar on this not too long ago, probably about five weeks ago. So I'm, I'm going to kind of buzz through this. Uh, if you're interested in drilling into this a little more, we put these webinars, by the way, some of you ask, yes, we, we put these up on our website. The slides will be available. The recording will be available. Uh, so you could go back if you want to drill into this topic of social media uh, a little more in depth. But it is important. It is very, very important for business development teams and organizations to be thinking along these lines. It, it's something we can't ignore anymore and think it's going to go away. So one way to do the long-term positioning um, is to through social media channels. It increases our uh, visibility. It's a way to validate claims that we're making. If, if we're making claims out there in the market through our advertising, our promotion, our website, our LinkedIn, you name it, our proposals, um, it's a way, uh, social media is a way to validate those claims and provide proof. Uh, if you're not reaching your potential customers, you can almost bet that your competitors are. Uh, so social media is a way for competitors to compete with us without us even knowing. So we need to be vigilant. We need to boost our brand, our reputation, increase our visibility using social media. Uh, and it, there is no doubt, there have been plenty of people through blog posts and, and what have you that validate that social media can in fact improve, uh, provide you win opportunities that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So a couple of best practices, social media, just kind of to review what we talked about in a previous webinar. You have to define which social media platforms you're going to use and what are your themes on those platforms. So do you want a different theme for each operating group of your company, a single theme for the company, for the organization? Keep your brand message consistent. No matter what platform or social media outlets you use, um, we, ha we have to be consistent in that. Uh, we can use, uh, boy, social media is a very, you, someone asked about tools for competitive analysis. Here you go. Check their Twitter account. Find out what they're posting on Twitter. What kind of news releases are going out from your competitors? Um, it becomes very, very strategic. 
and I, I, I can't emphasize this enough, um, social media posts and content are used in very, very strategic ways in business development. And we're seeing social media play out in politics, in local governments. And it is a factor when it comes to business development and trying to win. So you can use it as a research tool to research competitors. Uh, engage, interact, and humanize. This is where these LinkedIn platforms and things like that give us a chance to actually reach out to people person to person. But the, the best practice here is know your customer. You've got to know whether or not I want to be bothered by LinkedIn or not uh, or, or any other type of social media. So don't just do it across the board to everyone the same way. Like Daryl said, you, you need to know not only who your team is in BD, you need to know who your customer is. Multi use multiple platforms. There is no one size fits all. Get out there. Uh, content is king when it comes to social media. Uh, I think you know what that means, but uh, bad content, stale content, all of that uh, really can damage damage your brand. So uh, stay current, keep it current. Um, here's just a quote off of a, a blog. According to social media today, the average person spends 116 minutes on social media every day. That, that's a little bit of a scary statistic for me at my generation. <laughs> that equates to nearly a whole month out of the year on social media. So know your customer, uh, know who you're dealing with. If you're a novice, when it comes to social media for your business development team, study it out. You know, talk to people and, and learn about some of the options there. All right, uh, unpredictable customer buying schedule and process. This was a huge one. Um, a huge topic at the conference we were at. Uh, it's a huge topic in our day-to-day -day business uh, here at Shipley. Uh, government and business, and not, I'm not just tagging this on government customers, but business customers, um, they delay or they speed up acquisitions or solicitations, bid opportunities with little to no notice to suppliers. Eric, I'm going to ask you, uh, you know, having been not removed from actually running a BD team uh, for very long, what does this do to your team when this happens, when, when, when your customer delays or all of a sudden speeds up an acquisition? Well, obviously, it can be very disruptive in both, uh, you know, both ways. If they speed it up and uh, you don't know that it's coming, uh, then it can be very disruptive in terms of what it can do to you as far as your planning and execution on the total capture and proposal effort. If it's delayed uh, and you're receiving no information uh, from the customer in terms of what the new schedule is going to be, that obviously can be very disruptive uh, as well because uh, it's going to end up costing you a lot more. The first, you know, the first instance generally decreases probability of win. Uh, the second instance, generally, uh, it may help probability win, but it ends up costing you a lot more money. Uh, one of the keys to try and avoiding this is to make sure uh, that you remain in regular contact uh, with your government customer, especially their contracts organization. Uh, and that's something that we want to do. And what you want to do with that is make sure that you have a single point of contact in your organization which should be a contracts person so that they speak the same language and don't overdo it, but make sure that a relationship develops between those folks so that you can in fact check back periodically without irritating the customer uh, in the acquisition shop and try and get some ground truth in terms of what's really going on. Uh, that information can be a, as valuable as any other information you might get on the technical side the programmatic side, uh, or even on the competitive intelligence 
side. So make sure that uh, make sure you understand what's going on within that acquisition cycle, so that you don't get whipsawed uh, by these changes that occur without your knowledge that they're coming. Uh, thank you, Eric. That's that's right. In fact, you uh, you actually addressed one of the questions I've got here that someone submitted. Is you know how do how do we follow up with customers uh, and be you know good business developers and doing our job? How do we follow up without? Let's see. The question said irritating them. Um, so to your point, be on top of it. You know and. Uh, be aware. So another part of this trend really is, is this whole protest cycle. Uh, boy, it's with um, one company last week at lunch, and he said that um, they kind of build an expected protest into most of their bids. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's movements. There's movements both ways on this. You you read about it. You hear about it of... of uh, the federal government wanting to reduce or minimize protests and there's others that say absolutely not you know it's what keeps us honest so, so i don't know where this will go i don't think anyone does um you know as far as also unpredictability contract types you know we need to just be on top of that what what is the contract coming up uh, other transaction authority uh vehicles uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on this on the next slide. If you're not familiar with OTA, please get familiar with it. Um, it may take hold and really accelerate. It may not. I'll talk about that more in just a second. But again, there's alternative acquisition methods. That's a trend. There is a trend. There is some movement to try to accelerate the government, for example, the ability to acquire. Now you see this in business to business. Please don't take what I'm saying as just business to government because there's a lot of large businesses in the same problem. Acquiring products and services is way too cumbersome and they're trying to streamline it. We have to know what those are. If we're selling and we're positioning our services, our products, our company, we have to know what's going on. So we have to be nimble. We have to be flexible. We have to cross train our talent. Uh, you know, some of Eric's comments alluded to this. We've got to have people ready to roll if, if things happen and we're not quite expecting it. Um, uh, sometimes we might need to outsource or co-source to expand our ability to respond um, when, when these schedules fall on top of each other. You know, if we had our pipeline all laid out and we said, okay, we got these three major acquisitions coming up in the next quarter, but one of those accelerates their schedule and all of a sudden we've got two major ones that overlap, we now have a resource problem. And we may need to, to either do some quick hiring uh, or we need, may need to co-source or outsource. And again, learn and follow acquisition changes. So. OTA, just a quick comment on that because um, at this same APMP conference we attended, uh, many of you attended, I, I glanced through the registration list and so many of you were there as well. One of the actual keynote speakers of the whole conference addressed uh, OTA. Uh, it, it stands for Other Transaction Authority. It's, it's a contracting vehicle. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, bear with me, I'm going to read a little here from a, a fairly recent blog. Uh, OTA contracts seem to be the hip new thing in defense acquisition circles. The Defense Department, the services, and some of their components are all trying to jump on the OTA train as Congress continues to grant military more authorities with special contracts. Now there's the other side of the, the, the argument here. Others are trying to stop this movement and say this is not a good idea so there's two signs sides to this coin um, but let me read here um, and i'm quoting this mechanism ota this mechanism is just so much faster and so much more attuned to getting something quickly uh, that we want today and not have to spend a couple of years going through a protest going through this huge process to get something we wanted two years ago. 
That's a quote from the Air Force Director of IT Acquisition Process, Major General Sarah Azabel. Everyone is very enthusiastic about OTAs, still learning how to use them, still growing in the use, but they're performing very well. So this is a few months ago. Uh, Zabel, this is her again, said that the Air Force has a real interest in OTAs, especially in IT because of how quickly contracts can be awarded. She said at some points, the Air Force has held competitions where vendors bring their ideas and are given a contract at the same day. I would have loved to have been a fly on that wall. <laughs> so come to this conference, tell us what you got as far as an idea and a capability, and boy, we'll sign a contract. I, that's what she says. This can be extremely beneficial to IT when the rate of change far outpaces the speed of the traditional acquisition process. So it's real. Um, the DOD is not turning a blind eye to this. They're um, experimenting with it. DIUX, you know, some say it's in trouble. Some say it's going to be okay. This is the Defense Innovation Unit experiment. Um, the DIUX was actually a platform for OTAs for for these this new way of acquiring. Uh, I'm reading here, DIUX has awarded $100 million in funding to almost 50 programs. It's been able to obtain private investment to fund some programs. So uh, keep an eye on it. You know, I don't know where it's going to go, and, and none of us do. But we have to be aware and up to date what's going on with our customer. How are they acquiring goods and services? And then as a business development organization, we've got to align our strategy with that. And I know that sounds like business development 101, but too many of us don't stay current with what's going on uh, with our customers or in the market. The bottom line point here and the speaker two weeks ago <laughs> said the same thing, expect the unexpected. You know, change is the new normal in, uh, in acquisition process. Okay, uh, let, let, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. We also did a webinar that drilled into this a little more, but clearly a trend. There's a lot of focus on this balance between cost and performance risk. So if you've got a, a grid here, all right, where um, across the bottom you've got capability and up and down vertical you've got price, and this is this is how the customer thinks, right? They've got a minimal acceptable capability. Think of low price technically acceptable, right? There's a technically acceptable, minimally acceptable capability that they'll look at and they will consider. There's also this unacceptable. Submit me a proposal. It's not technically acceptable. It's out. It's unacceptable. Then there's this other line over here to the right side where anything more than what the customer asked for, way more than they asked for, is going to maybe be viewed as gold plating. Like, oh man, they're, they're gold plating this. We don't need all that extra stuff. Well, that's the government or the customer might see that as unachievable. No, there's no way that vendor can achieve that. So somewhere in the middle here, we have to create and balance the cost of what we're proposing, all right? It can't be up above over the maximum budget. It has to be somewhere between the addressable budget for the customer and what they consider to be minimally reasonable. It has to be in that, that window there. And that's where price to win and competitive assessment come in. When we're pursuing opportunity as a business development team. We can't be unacceptable. We can't be unachievable. We can't be unbelievable. We've got to fall within that window. So more and more, this is being emphasized. So this third bullet point here on this, this uh, screenshot here, uh, this may not be a direct quote, but I put it in quotes because it's close enough. One source selection, very experienced government evaluator 
said, I will take a higher price solution over a high risk solution any day. I represent the people of the government. I'm not going to put the government at risk by choosing a high risk solution. I'd rather pay a little bit more. So that, that was his message. And I, I think that resonates with most evaluators. Okay, uh, David, I'm going to ask you to comment on this one because I know over your career, you've had a lot of opportunity to work with companies that they they want to upgrade their overall maturity and overall BD capability, but they're not sure where to start. Could you um, just give us some thoughts that you have? These are kind of four areas we could focus on. What are you seeing out there as you interact with, with companies? Well, <clears throat> Brad, no longer can we be lazy and can we rest on our laurels and can we kind of just sit there and get by more and more now. You know, you alluded to a lot of portals that give us uh, competition. You alluded to systems that give us the capability to mature our, our in-house capacities and capabilities. And so we have to, to compete, we have to, to stay, you know, in the leading positions in these arenas, we have to get better at what we do. And those are typically in four areas. We have to know and understand who the customer is, and that's through a relationship. We have to have, you know, a management um, process that focuses on bid, no bid, you know, decision gates and reviews and all that maturity that says, okay, just because it's out there, if we're not positioned well, we should have the maturity to no bid. Uh, you know, you started off this with high performance people and retention and, and recruiting the best people possible. You know, that's got to be a foundation. I mean, you know, with the workforce getting younger and a lot more, um, you know, they move around a lot more. We've got to figure out ways to keep these people engaged with our business, retain them in our environment and, and train them and develop them and, and, and encourage them and allow them to uh, mature into a strong environment. And finally, you know, we have to have a legitimate, repeatable, quality-oriented process that improves our capability. We cannot, I can remember so long ago that every opportunity was, you know, we were doing it, inventing the wheel, I think the term was, every time. We can't afford to do that. We will be outclassed, we will be outperformed, we will be outbid, we will be out everything. If we don't have a process that is driven by our business development needs through these people focus and customer. Yeah, yeah, great, great summary. Um, so, you know, some, we have to put some focus on the organization as a whole. Um, Excuse me, I got, let me, I'm, I've got this one. I'm sorry, this goes back to my previous one, so I'm sorry about this, but this this goes back to that, that previous uh, slide where we talked about balancing cost and capability risk. What we're trying to do in that assessment is really make sure we're trying to move from being maybe unknown in our market positions to where we actually are favored because we've done our homework on price and capability. Uh, so, David, thank you for that, and, and I'm actually going to here in a minute come back to a couple of ideas on improving organizational capability when we talk about this, this maturity model. So, hang in there. We, we're going to address that, too. One other trend. Uh, boy, this, this was a, a big one at the conference, too. Automation. Um, capture and proposal automation tools, they continue to get better that there continue to be more of them to choose from. Artificial intelligence, AI is, is kind of starting to make its way into, you know, can we, uh, can we use some artificial intelligence in our business development? You know, jury's out, but pay attention to it. Uh, content and databases and repositories for our proposal content, our solution content, our competitor information becoming more and more common and people, you know this, the cloud is here to stay. Um, so this quote, to secure the best future for a company, adopting new technology may be the key to require uh, retaining 
and acquiring more business, more clients. So a couple of best practices for automation. Uh, do your homework. Try before you buy. Check with other customers that have already purchased this automation, and when, more than one. Is it going to be sustainable? When new versions come out, are you going to be able to adapt those and adopt those new versions? Do, will they address these new procurement policies coming out? Uh, again, this try before you buy. You better have a sustainment plan in place. Please talk to multiple users and customers of any automation tool. And I will say from our company standpoint, we're a little bit agnostic as far as automation tools because there is no one single right answer. There's a lot of good tools out there, but you have to figure out which one is right for your business. All right, so this goes back to what David talked about, um, and that is organizationally, more and more companies are actually starting to recognize BD, the people, what they're accomplishing, their motivation, as a core to their success. So we have to be able to forecast and manage our pipelines accurately. A couple of you, actually, when you're registered for this webinar, ask, how do we, do you have any, let's see, I'm just gonna read it. Uh, Tips for managing our opportunity pipeline, organization of it, resources, et cetera. Well, here you go. The, the main way is to, as David said, define a process, document the process, including decision gates, and stick to it. So strict decision gates become the best tool for managing your pipeline. So these are some ideas uh, when it comes to helping our organization be viewed as more of a core key element of business success within our companies. So, this goes back to, again, what David talked about, this organizational maturity of business development. And some of you are familiar with this. It's called the business development capability maturity model. But companies tend to operate in one of these five levels. Um, you know, they're either at the base of it, initial ad hoc processes, they're repeatable, they're defined, managed, or optimized. And David, this goes back to what you were saying. This all is dependent on the right people, the right process, the right tool. Any final comments on that, David? No, I mean, you know, Brad, the 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 key here is is you've got to know and understand where you are, and you have to be able to make the assessment and have the courage to do what it takes to get to the next level and that's off always pretty hard but you know the trend is is we have to get there and we have to do it to be able to compete so it's not merely an option to where we used to bid on everything in sight now we have to be mature and we have to have process we have to have gates and we have to have the right people so that we can you know the one bullet before we can minimize the risk of bidding you know, these are valuable dollars that we're spending. We need to optimize those to get the best return. Yeah, good. So this, I know this looks a little busy here on the right, but you know, if you want to go to level, from level N to level N plus one, you want to go from level one to two or two to three, you know, this is a, a very simple flow of of how do you do that as an organization? As a business development organization, where do you start? Well, you start down here with conducting a baseline appraisal. Where are you at? You know, where are we today? And you walk through and do that gap analysis. You you review your planning, your, your strategies, uh, assess your gaps, and then you put in place, how are we gonna get to the next level? Uh, well, we, we, we need to add infrastructure. We need new person, a couple of new, new key personnel. Uh, that's how we get better. Um, but it's so hard. Um, and Daryl, maybe you can comment on this. It's so hard to push the pause button on selling and business development activity and generating revenue 
to pay attention to this this bigger process and improve a long term. So long term versus short term conflict. Um, any thoughts there? Yeah, Brad, it's very true, and it's um, a couple of things on that. It's it's the whirlwind effect, right? All of our businesses, by definition, are, are cyclical in some way. So you get an initiative like this, and people start talking about it. Typically, when business is not going uh, that well, or there just happens to be some lull in activity, and then all of a sudden the tornado sirens go off, uh, the whirlwinds come, and everybody starts grinding on what happened before. So it takes, really it takes management commitment and focus and laying out a plan, a, a longer term plan. These are typically not things that can be, uh, you, you can't turn the ship quickly. It's gonna, it's gonna take a while to turn it around in a different direction and make those improvements. Uh, so it's really management commitment to making it happen. And like you said, the planning, the planning of the process as you go through. But, yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for all businesses and BD. It is. Uh, yes, it is. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, in summary, real quick, and, and again, thank you for your time today and, and uh, joining us. Uh, if you have any questions, I, I think most of you know how to reach us. Um, we'll give you our contact information here. But summarize, let virtual the wor virtual workforce be our friend. Learn how to manage that. Recruit the best talent we can. Uh, use new methods, creative methods. Know who our competitors are. Realize that new competitors are entering our market every day, regardless of our market. Leverage social media, long-term positioning, building relationships, networking. Count on the unpredictable customer buying schedule. It's not going to happen like they say it's going to happen usually. It's, it's going to be either drawn out or shortened. Be aware of the cost and risk as a as major evaluation for uh, factors. The government is doing more and more balancing cost and risk. Evaluate automation carefully. Um, the number of failed deployments of business development automation tools is a little bit staggering. If you're going to invest in it, make sure you support it with the right people and enough financial backing to make it work. We have to help our companies recognize business development is a core of business success. Uh, it's not automatic. It doesn't happen by itself. It, it, is, it is core. And then this last area David covered of, of if we want to advance maturity, uh, we've got to pay attention to it. We've got to maybe sacrifice some of the short-term gains for longer-term uh, larger potential gains. I want to address one more question uh, as we close here. Um, it, there was a, <laughs> this is a great question, by the way. So it reads, it says, given 10 bidders, two will score the highest in technical pass performance, but price is king. When is this not correct? So when isn't it correct that price is king? My response to that would be going back to that quote I gave you of one of the source selection evaluator team members. If the risk is too high, price is no longer king. If the government isn't 100% convinced that the supplier, the offerer, the bidder, the vendor, can do what they say they can do, price becomes secondary now. So we've got to be able to convince the customer, government or business or nonprofit, it doesn't matter, we've got to be able to convince them that we're not only the, the, the best solution, but there's, we're the low risk solution. So risk will outweigh price. The customer generally will not go out on a limb on a high risk uh, solution. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank Eric, David, Daryl. Um, Mallory has been in the background here moderating. Uh, thank all of you for uh, joining us. Have a great rest of this week. And uh, if we can answer any questions or help you going forward, uh, you know how to reach us at www.shipleywins.com. We'll post this on our website. 
you want to revisit it, uh, that'd be great. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.